All right, so for our first talk um, is developing a pedagogical tool for Arabic and Hebrew college students using current events online media from the Middle East. And we have three speakers for this. Um, so our first speaker is Hannah Zucker-Zeltzer, um, who is director of Hebrew language program at Northwestern University, where she also teaches. And she's been deeply involved with innovative course design that's related to the use of digital technologies. And I think we'll see that reflected in the talk that she's giving today as well. Um, and then our second speaker on the panel is um, Professor Ragi Ibrahim Michael, who's taught Arabic at a number of institutions, including Northwestern University. And in 2015, he received the Excellence in Teaching Award from the Council of Language Instruction. And he's the developer of the Living Arabic website, as well as a number of other innovations that are related to technology and language teaching. Um, we were joking at the beginning of the panel that if I talked about all the wonderful things all the speakers are doing, you wouldn't have a chance to hear what they're actually talking about today. So I'm gonna cut it a little short. Um, and then the third speaker on this panel is Dr. Francisca Lis who's professor of German and director of undergraduate studies for German and the director of MENA languages at Northwestern. And she has published very widely on the integration of language and culture. And she's uh, created a number of materials related to that, including a co-production of documentaries for use uh, as educational materials uh, and learning software that she's been involved in designing. Um, so they'll be talking with us about the work that they've been doing together. And so please join me in welcoming our first three speakers. Thank you, Chantal. So I'm going to share um, a PowerPoint for you. Uh, my name is Francisca Lise, and I am. My task is to uh, start out this uh, presentation. Um, my part will be very short because I have not been involved in teaching these courses, so I will leave the presentations to my to dear colleagues. My task is to sort of situate the foreign C US software and let you know what it looks like so we have a better understanding on how we worked with it. Um, as with any program um, that teaches Arabic, Hebrew, Turkish, and Persian, which we currently do, we all know that there is a limited choice of textbooks um, that are available. And especially if you come from German, um, this, is, this is really obvious or was really obvious to me. Many of the textbooks we have are um, soon obsolete because of the cultural information and outdated pedagogical approaches. We know that the textbook has a, a shelf life of four years and we just don't turn over textbooks for every four years. There's also a lack of intercultural communicative material to train language and cultural competency. And of course, there's a scarcity of appropriate teaching material beyond the second year. So while we might have uh, good material for first and second year, there is not that much material available for third and fourth year, which we currently teach in Hebrew and Arabic, um, that would be appropriate for the students. This is where we put our focus in the program for the last two years. We were trying to um, uh, rely on our own um, well-trained pedagogical skills to develop content-rich courses for third and fourth year. You already have heard, for those who were able to, get, to go to the presentation yesterday, the new city courses we are developing in Arabic, Hebrew, and Turkish. And parallel to that, we were um, developing two new media courses, media in the Middle East for Arabic and media in Israel for Hebrew. Now, I'm not gonna talk to you uh, about why media is a good source for authentic material to train language and culture competency. It's well established and there is a lot of literature out there. Um, however, if we talk about using media in the classroom, we know that it is really difficult for the instructor. The ephemeral nature of the media requires continuous preparation and sometimes it's just beyond what we can do, um, the daily preparation and, and make sure that the material we have is, is accurate and um, um, students can work with it. That is when we discovered Forency US as a software that um, really helps us, I think, um, teach these courses and work with the material. The um, Forency US is available to anybody who would like to use it. It's an online language tool for students with intermediate level of language proficiency, and it has lessons in Arabic, Hebrew, and Russian. 
And the tool organizes reading and listening material from the press and from media into topical lessons. And it gives us the, the relevant vocabulary that students would need to know in order to understand or work with the lessons. Here is how Forency introduces itself. So you're passionate about language learning, but frustrated by the lack of resources at intermediate to advanced levels, making it difficult to maintain or advance your proficiency. Well, there's a language learning tool designed just for you. It's called Forency. Forency's intermediate to advanced courses teach the core vocabulary you need to read, watch, and listen to foreign media on a diverse range of topics. By building comprehensive language skills based on real-world vocabulary, you'll work towards using your language professionally and reaching your goals. Simply select your target language and course from our ever-growing database. Then prepare to read, watch, or listen to real foreign language media using our custom-built flashcards and learning tools. You can save flashcards to your personal learning dashboard, export them to your preferred flashcard app, monitor your progress, and set daily goals and reminders. Take the next step towards language mastery with a tool tailored for your level and goals. Sign up with Forency today. Uh, rather than going on the site and trying to manage the site, we have captured a couple of screenshots to give you a flavor of how the site is organized. So <clears throat> when you get into the site, you have um, a way of selecting um, your lessons. So we have intermediate, advanced and sophisticated. You can choose the language and then you have all of these categories you can choose from uh, in terms of what you would like to cover in the classroom. And you can see uh, in this particular example, it gives you a flavor of the of the uh, topics that are covered. It's they're not topics that you usually would see in a in a textbook, but they are very relevant and very interesting to our students. Once you have your uh, your lesson chosen. Here is, for example, one on Lebanon and cannabis farming. It gives you an overview of the goals, what is being um, taught in the lesson, and it also um, gives you the subparts of the lesson. So if you would choose lesson number one, this is what you would see. Again, a description of the lesson, a, a video that introduces the topic. With it, you have a vocabulary list that you can either export in a PDF or in a Word document, which means for instructors, you can easily add, subtract words, and you can use the words for um, interactive exercises. Besides the video, you also have two tools to practice the vocabulary. On the right side, you see there the students has to match the Arabic with the English. And on the left side, it's a very fancy flashcard program where you have the Arabic. If you click on it, you get the English. You have a pronunciation of the word. And very interestingly enough, if you click on this button, it will um, it will save the words that you like into a separate flashcard program so students can actually make their flashcard program um, that is most useful to them. Once you have worked through the vocabulary, it gets you into a reading of the first article and it, it's not a copy, it gets you right into the newspaper. And so you can really work with the newspaper and the layout with your students. I have, I'm just going to run through a couple of screenshots um, so you can see what it would look like in Hebrew. Here is a, a lesson that Hannah used Syrians treated in Israel. You see the overview, you see the first part treatments and humanity without borders with the vocab lists. Again, you have the two vocabulary um, interactive uh, exercises that you can do with your students or uh, the students alone at home to sort of brush up on the vocabulary and it gets you into the reading site. We have used this site for two courses, uh, current events in Israel, Israel so Israeli society through online news media and current events in the Middle East, Arab society through online news media. So I'm going to defer to Hannah who will talk to us a little bit about how she organized the course in Hebrew. Okay, thank you Fatiska. Um, so uh, we had nine weeks uh, of the quarter and I had ambitious plans. I wanted to introduce the topic of Israeli media, specifics about the relationship between the state or the government and the media, freedom of press, um, if there are taboos that cannot be covered, 
I wanted also to work on six topics or complete six courses in fluency. As Francesca demonstrated, each topic is a course that breaks down to five lessons. Um, so I wanted to cover six full courses. And I also plan to have students' presentations about newspapers in Israel, another presentation about uh, weekly pictures that are published in an Israeli newspaper, Haaretz, to summarize the past week, and another presentation about historical newspapers. Uh, it was important for me since those newspapers had a central role in reviving and propagate Hebrew as a spoken language in the end of the 19th and, uh, 20, and, and the end of 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Um, in, um, in real life, I uh, learned that I was indeed too ambitious. I eventually worked with the students on four topics, um, or four courses in fluency, and students presented twice. One presentation was about newspapers in Israel, the other one was on weekly pictures, and we had the final project, which I'll say more about um, soon. Um, so um, in terms of the integration of materials in the classroom, in the first week, students um, read about the media in Israel and about the freedom of press in a Wikipedia entry that I referred them to, um, both in Hebrew and in English. Then we moved on to fluency, where students had to do preparation work before coming to class. In some cases, I asked students to read certain Wikipedia entries about a certain topic. For example, if we worked, uh, we began to work on a course about the Ethiopian community in Israel, then I asked them to read about the killing of, the killing of Solomon Teka, a young Ethiopian man by a police officer, and about the riots that it sparked in Israel in summer 2019. I also prepared a worksheet with questions and more vocabulary explanation that students were supposed to complete before class, again as a preparation for the a new topic. Um, and another thing that was important for me that students ex explore in this class was the variety of the online newspapers um, in Israel. So I prepared um, a page on Canvas with links to many homepage, um, and uh, we can see it actually in the uh, slides. Um, here you can see the, um, the page. It has uh, links to um, various uh, newspapers. Um, and I also wanted to, to um, so my idea was to expose, um, if you can also scroll, Francisca, to the other, um, the one with the Wikipedia. Yeah, so, so there's one, um, there was a page on the information about the newspaper, there was a page um, how to go directly to the uh, home pages of these newspapers. The idea is that students will be exposed to um, various newspapers, rightist and leftist newspapers, religious and secular newspapers uh, with social agenda and so forth. Um, after, presenting to, after presenting to the students two homepages on two different newspapers, their presentation was um, about such newspaper. They basically chose a newspaper and presented on it in class using um, the information from Wikipedia they also had available about it. Um, their second presentation was to select one picture from the weekly pictures in Haaretz newspaper. Haaretz had a section, has actually a section called This Week's Pictures in Haaretz, Tmunot HaShavua Shalitona Haaretz, and this has a summary of the week in pictures. So I created a page in Canvas where I updated the, the pictures weekly. You can see one of those pictures um, um, that was uh, during one of the weeks uh, in Haaretz, um, and students chose a picture and in the week of their presentation, basically they went to that page, they chose a picture and they researched the context of the picture and analyzed the class and analyzed the picture in class and talked about the story behind the picture. Um, for final project, students chose from a selection of articles and videos in fluency and presented on them in class. Um, as for the effectiveness of fluency, as Francisca showed, the levels move from intermediate to advanced and sophisticated. But I must say that in the case of Hebrew, even the intermediate level is pretty advanced. So even though I chose to work only with intermediate materials, often it was packed with complex language and it is also very fast um, if, it's, um, if we talk about videos. The option to listen to the new words and expression is great, and so is the list of vocabulary in the matching game that you showed in, in, uh, earlier in the slides. Um, but yet there is a gap between the level of the article or video and the student's ability to understand it. Unfortunately, many of the videos didn't have subtitles, and this is related more to Israeli TV. The news um, often shows, um, often don't show the subtitles unless 
it's outside or they think the sound is unclear. So sometimes we had subtitles, sometimes we didn't. Yet, it was incredible for students to be in direct contact with authentic TV shows and to hear different speakers of Hebrew. Another big advantage is that students developed an awareness to the language of Israeli media. They recognize the terms that we carry in articles, or in the case of videos, they even learn to recognize the tone of Israel reported, such as, um, And they also became more aware to the differences between the formal and the written languages in articles versus the more colloquial and spoken languages, language. Some suggestions for uh, improvements. So I think exercises should be more gradual and aim to affirm general understanding by giving part of the answers. So for example, more multiple choice questions um, and less open-ended questions. And it would also be helpful to have more vocabulary as I did in my worksheets. Um, in some of the topics and courses, the lesson and the units are based on their preceding lessons. Uh, but in other topics, each lesson or each um, unit is a separate subtopic. So in such cases, um, in the future, I would choose a certain topic or a certain lesson from the full course, and then it will allow us to taste more topics rather than like, so instead of having uh, dealing with only four topics, we would be able to actually cover more, maybe nine topics. In the future, I would also love to work with Ragi, my colleague, who will soon talk about his course, um, or with other colleagues in Arabic. And I would love to collaborate together um, on topics that um, appear also in foreign in Arabic and foreign in Hebrew. And they will allow conversation in English between the students in Hebrew and the students in Arabic. And I think that would be wonderful to talk about the comparison. Thank you. Raggy, you're on mute. Forgive me. Uh, <laughs> uh, my name is Raggy Mikhail. Um, <clears throat> I'm the author of uh, Baron's Arabic, The Fast and Fun Way. I'm uh, one of those who, uh, uh, who, who care for uh, dealing with Arabic uh, in its sociolinguistic reality, addressing both the spoken Arabic and written Arabic, modern standard Arabic. Um, Actually, uh, uh, I'm very thankful for Forensi. It took a huge part of the load uh, of preparing vocab and uh, creating at least one exercise uh, on, on these vocab and also um, uh, dealing with the pronunciation, uh, creating uh, uh, Quizlet packs. So Forensi did all of that for me. It categorized it, it categorized uh, recent news um, in more than 30 topics, uh, like uh, Dr. Liz showed in her slide. Uh, but I have only nine weeks, and I decided that I will divide the week into, uh, I mean, I teach twice a week. So in each session, I, I, I took one example of uh, written media, and, on, and then and on, on Tuesday and on Thursday, I talk a visual media. The good news about uh, Forensi is that uh, it has embedded videos with each piece of news. And this is not an invention. It's not rocket science. It's simply the nature of online media right now. It, there's no piece of media, uh, I mean, where you have the article without an embedded video. Um, so this saved me a huge time looking for the material. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, the initial uh, initial use of vocab was uh, was done by the students at home, but when we are in class, it is me who has to extend and expand uh, the use of vocab uh, in a, a warm up, ten to fifteen minutes, and then move on to the discussion of the article. Students needed to uh, to be prepared um, in assessment. Uh, I used short quizzes, I used writing reflections, uh, I asked for uh, developing of uh, uh, videos. Um, uh, I, haven't, I haven't moved yet. <laughs> okay. And I, I also used an oral chat, uh, oral uh, final discussion. And uh, you will be uh, surprised if I, uh, uh, 
if I, if I share with you some of the products of the students at the end of the course, the product is uh, committed to, is linked to uh, a piece of news and they have to, uh, to create something visual uh, based on that and also to produce uh, uh, some uh, reflective writing. Um, okay, uh, uh, I mentioned that, uh, yeah, the fact that you have the video and you have the written material helped me to emphasize on, uh, you know, using the video for listening and speaking and also uh, uh, using the, the article itself for writing and reading. The issue is um, Forensi did not provide any, uh, uh, anything to deal with the spoken part of the videos in any profile, in any feature, in any investigation uh, in, 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 in the press, you, uh, you do have, uh, you know, you have, do have to speak with people and people don't speak MSA. So they spoke uh, in their dialect. It was a brilliant uh, experience for students to be exposed to uh, women uh, uh, complaining about the Yemeni war, uh, uh, Lebanese discussing the cannabis problem, uh, Palestinians discussing about the coexistence uh, in, 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 in the education system between the Palestinians and the Israelis, and, it, and with people from Cairo. So the, rea the sociolinguistic reality of the Middle East is manifested in this news where students learn that they don't have to that, that these dialects are not independent languages. Uh, if I have to, I mean, uh, for the vocab practice, uh, I haven't finished, sorry. For the vocab practice, uh, it wasn't, um, uh, I mean, I needed to, uh, to uh, I recommended that Forensi would provide uh, more, uh, more work on that. Otherwise, I am happy with what Forensi provided because it is my, uh, role as a teacher to create such material. Uh, and breakout rooms tend out uh, to be uh, a very, very enriching, very uh, ideal for cooperative uh, learning. I did not emphasize uh, grammar except when it showed up uh, uh, in the text. And mostly it was uh, advanced grammar topics. The fronted predicate, uh, fronted predicate is not one of them, uh, but Arab connectors, the maf'ul mutlaq, the accusative of the absolute, the uses of ma, the permutative, and so on. Next, please. Um, yes, uh, this ended up being uh, a course following one theme, social justice. I spoke about, I mean, we've, we've seen pieces about coexistence, whether it is between Sunni and Shiites in Iraq or uh, Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, uh, it was about Bl Black Lives Matter. I, I started the course with uh, civil rights movement, but I have to admit that Black Lives Matter discussion of the piece of news was the climax of this course. And I also included cultural elements about life in Saudi Arabia uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, the, and, and its relation to tourism. Um, uh, in my textual analysis, if you want to call it this way, I really paid attention to the style because usually in Arabic teaching before the fourth year or even after the fourth year, styles don't show up. So I did my best showing uh, the uniqueness of Arabic in terms of using metaphor even in the media language. Uh, it's not all reporting and also all Arab, uh, Arab speakers and Arabic teacher uh, listening here know um, uh, the, the lack of teaching the five st styles of, uh, of a nah. Um, I also highlighted why in some pieces the author is not able to say the truth the way it is. Like in, uh, like in America, this was something that we needed to, to figure out, which is reading between the lines, as I uh, uh, call it. Uh, also, uh, I spoke about the, my, my opportunity to, to really have applied analysis, contrastive analysis between Fusha and different dialects of Ami. Next, please. Uh, Francisca, oh yeah. So uh, if I want to add something to, uh, to Forensi, I would ask for 
more voweling of the flashcards. Um, and, uh, and I had to prepare all the discussion questions for all the pieces of news. Forensi had nothing of that. Um, uh, I also uh, picked like a couple of videos in which I only asked the students to, to answer my questions without me providing any uh, uh, written uh, script. Uh, I had to write all the scripts. Uh, also, uh, uh, as a teacher, I had to provide more analysis of the idioms and expressions and to shift the, the, the students' uh, zone of thinking from English, from uh, the, they shouldn't think in English zone into Arab zone. Uh, and, and I shifted them to the Arab zone. Uh, we were uh, aware of the issue of one-to-one -one translation, even though uh, this is not a translation course. I provided all the needed cultural backgrounds uh, uh, to, to explain why the use of the word black, for example, is uh, problematic in Arabic and how it differs and, and, and those backgrounds. Next, please. I think that's it. So um, thank you, Ragi. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, we would like all of you to go and check it out. It's a really fabulous uh, software, piece of software, piece of learning software and um, for the intermediate to advanced level. And uh, yeah. Thank you so much to all of you for this talk. And it is a project that is ongoing. So the feedback is incredibly helpful um, as well. All right, our next, uh, presentation is Enhancing Linguistic Complexity in L2 Arabic Using Interactive Task-Based Instruction. Um, and our two speakers are Mahmoud Azaz and Isham Asawi. So Dr. Mahmoud Azaz is Associate Professor of Arabic and Second Language Acquisition and Teaching at the University of Arizona, where his excellence in teaching has been recognized by a Provost's Award in 2020 and an award from the College of Social and Behavioral Studies uh, Sciences in 2017. He's currently the Arabic sector head for the American Association of University Supervisors, Coordinators, and Language Program Directors, uh, which we call AAUSC. And he currently has a monograph on Arabic language learning under contract with Rutledge and is working on a textbook for Arabic as well. And he'll be presenting together with Dr. Isham Asawi, who's currently Assistant Professor of Arabic at Virginia Military Studies, um, but also he's also a graduate of our program here in Second Language Acquisition and Teaching. And his research relates to Arabic language and culture, Arabic dialects, sociolinguistics, and second language teaching and learning. So please join me in welcoming our next two speakers. You see my screen quite well, everyone? Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Chantal. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to um, uh, be here. I have seen a good number of presentations. Uh, they are really innovative in many ways. Uh, for some time, Hisham and I, um, before he moved to Virginia Military Institute, we have been really interested in the concept of linguistic complexity. What really makes a language sample produced by a student, if it's already a spoken sample or a written sample, more complex than another? And how does this construct of linguistic complexity or language complexity relates to the concept of proficiency? We all know that text type is kind of the word or the phrase that actually uses to refer to that aspect in the OPI, the oral proficiency guidelines. And it refers, as we all know, to the amount of language that's produced by a learner in a spoken session. It scales up from very basic things like speaking and memorize the chunks to creating connected texts or discourses at the very uh, advanced levels. But what is really linguistic complexity? How should we approach it? What was important to us is how we should really scaffold it, how we should get our students to produce more complex language. Perhaps as you can see here on the first sample of a student production, we would agree that the first sample is not really complex. An important observation here is there is really a lack of, lack of 
connectives, lack of coherence in that part. But if you contrast the first to the second, we would agree that the second one is more sophisticated than the first. The apparent measure here is how many content words the student has been able to produce. So linguistic complexity does seem to be an important indicator or measure of language proficiency. And there is a need to care about it. But research in second language acquisition that worked on linguistic complexity more or less touched on two main aspects. The first is the lexical feature of a language sample. And this refers to the content words, that's the number or the ratio of nouns, adjectives, verbs, adverbs, the main words, let's call them the content words, in contrast to the functional words like prepositions or the definite article. But the second most important feature of linguistic complexity is syntactic in nature. And this basically refers to the coordination, the subordination, and how long the clauses are. So these three things contribute to the syntactic complexity part. When you combine the lexical and the syntactic, we have the language or the linguistic complexity. Our interest was, or is still in how we use interactive task-based learning to scaffold language complexity or linguistic complexity. And of course, that idea has been in the field for a lot of time. We are aware of the uh, significance of interaction in second language acquisition in the work of Susan Gans and Long and many, many others who demonstrated that interaction between students or between the teacher and the student is really helpful. It gives the students the opportunity to fix their language, to observe some, something in a template that a uh, teacher provided, and it really helps the students to improve or grow we decided to combine two things in one. The first is linguistic complexity as a measure of proficiency. And the technique that we are using is task-based interaction. By task-based interaction, I mean when everything in the interactive protocol between the student and between the teacher is about the learning task. Something that the teacher starts the conversation with. And in task-based learning, as we know, there is the planning uh, time for the task, where you give them like a handout, give them some basic instructions, and then you start working on the task. But in any learning task, as we will demonstrate in a minute, more or less we have the lexical and the syntactic features that we map into the task. Because by the end of the task, we need our students to solve a problem, identify a goal, make a decision, and in between, they are using syntactic and lexical features. So we asked in this question, uh, in this research project, two basic questions. The first is, to what extent can task-based interaction enhance or improve linguistic complexity in L2 Arabic? And linguistic complexity here defined as the amount of content words that a student would use and the syntactic features. And syntactic features mean three things. Let's keep them in mind. How long their clauses are, the ratio of subordination and coordination. But the second interesting question to us, is it really possible to help students to transfer the learning that happens in an, any interactive episode or protocol to the presentational mode? when the topic of the task is still the same. Let's see if you are engaging with a student about how to choose a roommate. Is it the case that students will transfer the knowledge from that interactive protocol to the presentational mode of communication when we ask them to give a presentation about your favorite uh, room uh, roommate? So these are the two basic questions we are interested in. So, um, uh, to do this, I will just give the floor now to Hisham uh, to talk about the target language functions that we decided working on and the tasks that we developed. Okay, uh, thank you, Mahmoud. Can uh, everybody hear me? Yes, okay, excellent. 
so like Mahmoud said, uh, we put a lot of uh, thought into the design of these uh, tasks. And the goal was uh, how could we uh, best trigger uh, the language learners to produce uh, not only more language, but more complex and more uh, sophisticated language. So we opted for meaning-based activities uh, that takes the pressure of uh, the focus on, uh, on form to focus on meaning. Uh, and this way we could bring, uh, could bring forth uh, more complex structures uh, into the picture. And uh, we thought the design should also take into account a, a gradual increase in accuracy uh, demands. Uh, so throughout the task, it starts out simple, it, it increases in complexity. And as you will see later from the results, uh, there, is, uh, there is a gradual increase in accuracy towards the end, especially towards the presentational mode. And uh, we also thought that these tasks should have an outcome uh, of this, uh, the type solving a problem or uh, reaching a consensus of sorts. Uh, and so the question was, the main question uh, for us was, uh, which tasks can achieve the highest number of negotiations between uh, us and the participants? And we opted to choose decision-making uh, for, uh, for the sake of this uh, presentation. Uh, so we'll focus on uh, decision-making activities uh, where at the end of the activity, uh, participants are asked to make some sort of decision and all, along the way, they have to rationalize that decision. And in doing so, uh, this also requires them to use uh, specific types of language. So we created the need for them to use specific structures and specific language uh, so that it takes the pressure of focusing on form uh, to focus on meaning so that it frees up resources uh, for more uh, intensive and more demanding interactions. Um, okay, uh, so, um, <clears throat> so here uh, there are two types of tasks. Uh, one is uh, creating with language, uh, and we created uh, four of those types, and one is narration and we created four of those uh, tasks as well. Okay, next slide. So here what you see is a sample task uh, in which uh, participants are uh, asked to uh, decide which roommate they would like to, uh, uh, to be with, uh, and, um, <clears throat> and uh, they're given some time to think about it. Uh, at first, uh, we wanted to, uh, we first selected a few prototypes of language uh, like coordination and subordination, uh, and we brought them into focus uh, throughout these tasks. Um, and we made them uh, more salient. And so our goal here was to motivate learners to invest as much time and as much mental energy uh, in the task completion. And we also try to trigger processes of negotiation. Uh, for example, uh, why would you choose uh, uh, roommate A versus roommate B and so on. Uh, and we try to counterbalance, you know, uh, we, we tried not to make one roommate look really bad to make a very easy uh, choice or one that looks really good. Uh, so there was some counterbalanced uh, information here uh, that makes either or could be uh, uh, attractive. Uh, for the participant. Um, <clears throat> of course, we also uh, use several techniques in the elicitation, uh, such as uh, clarifications. Uh, we did a lot of comprehension checks to make sure that uh, uh, learners are understanding what we are uh, in the process of doing. And when we transition from one step to another, uh, recast and things of this sort, uh, because we really wanted to increase the complexity by focusing on uh, the processing um, and making it very uh, necessary for effective communication. Um, <clears throat> okay, so next slide. Okay, um, so we targeted uh, mostly the intermediate level. Uh, because as we all know, uh, this is the level that uh, uh, learners are, uh, they seem to be, it's a notorious uh, level because uh, learners seem to be on a perpetual state 
of being intermediate for the longest time. Uh, it's the phase that takes the longest for learners to transition uh, out of, very specifically. Um, <clears throat> so the goal was to see to what extent we can uh, uh, help this particular level. Uh, of course, keep in mind that these were only two sessions, so it is, it is not uh, a cure or uh, something that will overnight bring the level from uh, intermediate to advanced. Uh, but we really try to get a glimpse of uh, how much can we push the students to uh, produce more sophisticated uh, language. Um, <clears throat> and our goal was also to push the output further um, <clears throat> and, to, and to get them out of their comfort zone uh, because uh, students always have these safety nets that they always resort to uh, whenever they're in doubt. So they were, uh, they were always use less marked structures uh, as opposed to the more marked and more complex ones. But we really try to bring them out of this, uh, uh, of this uh, comfort zone. And, uh, and what we notice is that uh, the initial fluency that we, uh, that the students were trying to uh, respond with uh, slowly started to transition to actually more accurate accounts of and more accurate uh, stretches of uh, sentences. Um, <clears throat> and they tried to use more irregular forms uh, and, they and they started using more uh, 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 less common forms, uh, for instance, when given the choice between uh, a less common and a more common, uh, when we ask them, you know, if there are any other ways you could express the same thought, uh, then they really started to get out of their comfort zone and, uh, and use more irregular forms and more marked forms. Uh, we all know from a marketness uh, theory perspective, uh, more marked are always more complex uh, because they always involve uh, the addition of uh, affixation, the addition of uh, different uh, conjunctions, uh, the coordination and the subordination of different clauses, uh, and so on. <clears throat> so the bottom line here, we try to uh, increase the complexity uh, by making uh, the focus uh, less on form, uh, more on meaning, uh, in order to make it necessary for effective communication. But uh, within uh, within this design, there was uh, some sort of focus on the forms because we had some prototypes in mind um, that the students needed to use in order to uh, to successfully complete the transaction. Okay, uh, so next to Mahmoud. Okay, uh, thank you, Hisham. Um, uh, Chantal is telling us we have only five minutes. Um, I really wanted to uh, walk you through um, like a sample of a student production. And then we will end up um, with some basic uh, implications. We hope that, we really wished that the time could allow us to um, talk about the rest. But let me get to stop sharing this one and then get to share um, the actual protocol because I think it's, it's important to, uh, to present. So um, this is basically, what happened in the interactive protocol with the students. So we basically um, start by giving them the question, which is with which roommate are you going to live and why? And then we engage them in an extended interaction uh, between the interlocutor, uh, one of us, Hisham and I, and the students. And here I'm highlighting the outcome, the target that Hisham and I were actually going for. And we waited to make it to that point. We know in Arabic verb to like, we say, I like to uh, using the uh, mansub or the subjunctive, or you can also use the master for, right? After like. So we were basically interested in walking the students to that point. So after each piece of the interaction, we achieved the goal and then we moved forward. And by the end of the protocol, we just give them the floor to give the presentation at the end. So this was kind of the, the main goal, goal that we were targeting. But to build this up, to get to that chunk of language in their presentation, we walked them 
through the different portions of the task. And I think Hisham talked about, we were working on one segment at a time. By this, we meant one part of the task at a time. So if the student has to make a decision about which roommate to live with in light of six pieces, we worked on each piece at a time. But the purpose was to walk them through to this. In between, we applied an interactive protocol uh, that we already used from Susan Gess and colleagues, where we uh, divided or coded the data into the meta language, the negotiation of meaning, basically when the student makes a mistake, and then you recast and ask them if it's already the masculine form or the feminine form. There is also the clarification request. There is also giving them a gesture or a clue that something was wrong in the sentence that you produced. And we did not offer the answer. We just gave them the floor to revisit uh, the output. Also, in many occasions, we gave them a connector and then we asked them in English to restructure the thought using that connector. And the reason for doing this was to just to try to make them jump from the coordination, which does seem to be much simpler, to the subordination in the uh, 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 clause structure. I'll get back here to uh, share the screen one more time. and get to the, um, to the PowerPoint. Uh, so, so just to skip this for the sake of time, um, that's kind of, the, kind of the output that we, the goal that we had, and that's from a different student. I hope the sound works. Zemina uh, um, uh, um, and I read and Aish Ma Zamila Alati Tohib and Mashi Aidan. Ohib 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 and Ashu Mubaraka. Well, the Dalek read and Ashu Ma Zamila. Alati Tohib Tashu Tohiban Tashu Mubaraka Aidan. Anna La Anka, or no, Anna La Aharush. Um, I read an Um, um, Al Aish fi Mentakat Hadia Island. Um, oh, I'm missing again. Any, any other ideas, not necessarily the ones among uh, the thoughts that we talked about. You can just basically extend the task to other uh, things. Okay. Um, and I'll give a Rossima or a Tobach. Well, is that like a Ridan or a Rid Zemila and a tea to him and Och Edan? Anna Taliba, um, 
و اريد ان اسكن مع طالبة ايضا Okay, that was like a demonstration of the goal of this. So we basically walked to the students uh, working one piece at a time in an interactive uh, protocol to make them get to that point where they really produce a chunk of language, something that's really coherent. Uh, the arrows here and these brackets refer to the coding system that we are using in the analysis of the data, where we are using the arrow where the focus here is on read n. Uh, as con n, the use of different verbs that express more or less the same idea in Arabic. We are also using the brackets to refer to the moments of silence, the pause, because this is also interesting when we get into the fluency part. But for the first piece of the study, we are working on the complexity part. Uh, uh, so for the sake of time, basically what we found is the student's linguistic complexity improved a lot from the presentational mode that we did before the interaction to the presentational mode again after the interaction. But I would say the effect was not the same in the lexical, which is the ratio of the content words, subordination and coordination. We found more progress in ratio and the ratio of the lexical aspects of the language and the coordination types of clauses than in the subordination one. And this is perhaps to the complexity of uh, the subordination uh, in the system of languages. I will give the floor now to Shem to just briefly talk about the implications of this. Okay, so just to kind of uh, wrap up uh, the uh, the discussion, uh, we thought this is interesting from uh, a pedagogical point of view. Um, if we're interested in bringing forth uh, more language production, uh, we have to take into account uh, both the uh, the acquisitional steps that learners go through uh, and whether they are developmentally ready at each point to transition from, uh, uh, let's say, structure A or feature A to feature B. Uh, the scaffolding that Mahmoud was talking about um, refers specifically to this. Uh, there is There are some acquisitional steps that we have to take into account. And in order to bring students from step A to step B, we have, uh, or from A to C, we have to take into account step B. Uh, are they developmentally ready to produce that target structure or not? Uh, it's also interesting from a, a computational and a corpus uh, point of view, uh, because it, uh, it, uh, it lets us see uh, the types of uh, combinations that students use uh, whether it is at the word level, uh, uh, the affixational uh, procedures, whether students leave out uh, affixes or attach them. Uh, there are, in the data that we looked at, there are many cases of ellipsis uh, where students will uh, omit or leave out uh, stuff. Uh, or there are cases where they would attach uh, things um, uh, in the right uh, place, uh, that means they were successful at the uh, at the production of that particular feature. Uh, it's also interesting from a corpus potential because uh, because uh, gathering uh, several samples of this sort uh, gives us a bigger picture of the different stages that students go through uh, to transition from uh, different uh, major levels of. Uh, proficiency and also sub uh, levels of proficiency. Um, we all know how hard it is to transition from uh, intermediate high to advanced low and become stable at that level. So this, this gives us a, a good picture of what happens uh, during these uh, subdivisions and transitional stages. Uh, I think that's all we have uh, for today. Is there something else, Mahmoud? Uh, just, I hope to, um talk in some detail when we get to the breakout rooms. We have different pieces uh, that we did not have the time to talk about. Uh, for example, one interesting thought is, how really should we do this, take this to the classroom? Because Hashem and I developed lesson plans uh, where we really guide teachers. And instead of starting by a specific structure, you start by the task. You develop your lesson plan based on the task, and then you take the task and step into the class. How would we use this in practical terms in teaching Arabic and perhaps with 
implications to other less commonly taught languages. That's perfect. Thank you. Yes, I hope that's something that um, people can continue to talk about. I'm sure people will have additional questions. Thank you both for this wonderful talk. Our third and final presentation and project is going to be on an online theme-based Persian picture dic dictionary. Um, and this is presented by Nargis Nimatolahi. Um, and Nargis is an assistant professor of Persian language in the School of Middle Eastern and North African Studies and in the Roshan Graduate Interdisciplinary Program in Persian and Iranian Studies here at the University of Arizona. And her research is uh, focused on the epistolary tradition in pre-Islamic Iran and how it's transformed in early medieval Iran under the influence of Arabic. And her broader areas of research are in stylistics, old, middle, and modern Persian, historical linguistics, and formal linguistics of Iranian languages. But you'll see, I think, in the talk that she's also uh, interested in, in the teaching of Persian as well. Um, so welcome, Nargis. Thank you very much, Antal. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm glad to present the online uh, team-based Persian picture dictionary project that I for which I received a grant from Circle last May. So first, I'm going to give you the roadmap of the talk. Yes. So uh, in this talk, first I give a brief survey of English Persian dictionaries, both paper and online ones, uh, uh, discussing the shortcomings and uh, the features of these dictionaries, uh, especially as far as the novice and intermediate learners are concerned. I think the shortcomings will demonstrate the need for a good Persian learner's dictionaries, as I will show in my later in the talk. And then because I think all Persian uh, language instructors agree with me that when students ask uh, us about good uh, Persian dictionaries, we don't have good options to offer. So I'm interested after the talk to uh, learn more about the state of arts for uh, Arabic and Turkish dictionaries. But for Persian, unfortunately, we don't have good Persian learners dictionaries. Uh, and then uh, I will introduce the online Persian picture dictionary, which is supposed to solve uh, one of the problems of the existing dictionaries that is giving easy access for pronunciation of the new words. Uh, for the resources that I looked uh, in order to make sure that I'm updated on the, all the existing uh, and most updated uh, current existing dictionaries. Uh, so I looked at Hillman's chapter on second language vocabulary acquisition, Persian resources and teaching and learning strategies in the Rutledge Handbook of Second Language Acquisition and Pedagogy of Persian in 2020, and also Botany's chapter on recent advances for Persian lexicography. I also did some Google search to make sure that I have updated information about the existing English Persian dictionaries. So the two dictionaries that I will uh, examine in this talk are Farhang Muasar English Persian Dictionary by Botany. Uh, it was published in 1993, but it has lots of uh, re-edition and the second edition was in 2003 and also in later years. And then Farhang Muasar Millennium, Farhang uh, Muasar Hazare English Persian Dictionary by Hakshanas and uh, others uh, published in 2009. Uh, in this talk, I will dis I want to discuss the Persian English dictionaries. Um, so two of them are listing in this uh, uh, slide. I won't talk about them, but I should briefly mention that they are actually better suited for uh, learners' needs than the English Persian ones. So because they have some keys for pronunciation, uh, they have some usage information. But we know that novice and intermediate learners. For the most, they refer to in, uh, English Persian dictionary. So for example, they, when they want to compose something or they want to give an oral report, they have the words in English in their mind and what they want to find the equivalent. So for novice and intermediate learners, uh, they are English Persian dictionaries that are referred the most. So I'm focusing on those. Uh, so for uh, in order to examine how well these dictionaries work for uh, learners. I chose some of some words and I looked them up. So for example, the word broken, when the learner wants to say that the fridge was broken or my car is broken down. So in botany's dictionary, more than 11 word equivalents are listed for broken. And only nine sense number 11 is the one which works for when the student wants to say that the fridge is broken. 
uh, it's not ideal, yes? Yeah? So the learners need to go through all other senses and for most part, he makes the mistake until by chance he finds the word in, in sense number 11. Or for example, the word for old uh, in Persian, we have two, at least two words for old. It is different if we want to say an old man or when uh, compared to when we want to say an old city. So uh, uh, the, the dictionary, of course, uh, lists both, uh, both senses, but it doesn't have any usage guide uh, as to which one to use. So the student is by his or her own to choose one of them and it might work, it might not work. Or for example, the verb miss, uh, if the student wants to say, I miss you, something which is very frequently he wants to say, or I miss my parents. It is only sense number nine which works. Uh, and again, there is no usage information as how to use this word. Uh, the second dictionary, Farhangi Moasar Millennium, uh, is, uh, has some improvements because as you can see, it categorizes different meanings based on fields and subfields. So for example, for broken, it, it is talking about uh, a train, then it is says uh, broken is nahambar. Or for broken down, uh, it says if you are using it for a, a car or for an instrument, then it gives the uh, right equivalent. For old also, so for example, it's, uh, it lists uh, peer, mosen as the first sense, but in the fourth, uh, in number four, it says if you are talking about cars or clothes, then you should use qadimi or kohme. The same for me, so again, it, uh, so we, uh, we already see some improvements in Parhangi Master Hezare as compared to the previous dictionary. But something which is missing in both dictionaries is that there, there are no keys for pronunciation of the Persian words. And uh, uh, the Persian script, just like Arabic, doesn't show the short vowels. So the pronunciation of the new words is unpredictable unless, unless you have the vowels. So in these dictionaries, they even don't show the diacritic signs. So the diacritic signs can help for understanding, for uh, finding out and finding the correct pronunciation, but they don't even give the uh, vowels. So for pronunciation, uh, there is no keys for pronunciation in these two dictionaries. So as remarks on English Persian picture dictionaries, no keys are given for pronunciation of Persian words and ordering of the senses is not based on learner's priorities. So I assume that the audience for these dictionaries are native speakers of Persian. They are not uh, intended for learners of Persian. They are for native speakers of Persian who have some words in English. They want to see what the equivalent is in Persian. Or the audience are professional translators or for the uh, they advanced and superior learners can uh, use these dictionaries if they can navigate through the senses to find the right equivalent. For English Persian online dictionaries, there are a few of them. Uh, I only choose two of them because many of them are very similar to each other. So I only show two of them, the Farsi dictionary and Google English Persian dictionary. So as you can see, uh, again, I work, I'm working for, with the same word, for example, broken. In Farsi dictionary, Again, there, is, there are no keys for pronunciation of the Persian words, but the good thing, the good improvement that it has made over the uh, paper dictionaries it is that it has some illustrative uh, examples. So uh, you see the illustrative examples, and then it has categorized the meanings based on different senses, but the list is not comprehensive and is not based on the learner's uh, priorities. So for example, if you look at the list, there are no uh, uh, English uh, examples for broken car or for broken fridge. You have uh, some more complex uh, examples, but not the examples that actually the learner needs. For Google English version translation, if you look up broken, it gives you uh, 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 an equivalent which doesn't work for broken fridge or broken car. But if you actually uh, look up broken fridge, then it gives you the correct um, equivalent. So the learner, in order to be able to find the right equivalent, he needs to enter the phrase, not, not only the word. And it's something that actually we as language instructors, um, we don't like our students to do that because if they look up the phrase and then uh, later on they look up the whole sentence and then they lose control over what they are writing. So we want them to just look up the words and then uh, come up with the structure, with the grammar themselves so that they have control over what they are writing. 
So as uh, concluding remarks on English, Persian, online dictionaries, again, no keys are given for pronunciation of Persian words and only advanced and superior learners can use the dictionary. But uh, a good improvement in these dictionaries is that they include examples and the examples come from a corpus. However, the examples seem to be randomly selected by a software rather than by a lexicographer. So the senses are not, um, they, there are not good categorizations and there are no prior priorities over, for example, which sense uh, the uh, learner is more likely to look up. So there are none of these features in online dictionaries, but at least they have examples which come from a course. Uh, so uh, now I think we have a better understanding what a good English Persian learner's dictionary must have. So first of all, it should give an easy access to pronunciation of the Persian words. The order of the sentences must be based on the learner's needs, for example, and also there should be a more limited number of the equivalent words. A learner doesn't need uh, 12 equivalent words for broken. He might only need four or five of them, and the orders must be based on his needs. And also uh, the good English version diction learner's dictionary provide usage information, whether grammatical, contextual, and also it provides illustrative examples. So these are the main tasks of a lexicographer. And I should mention that uh, none of these dictionaries are actually intended for learners of the language. All of them have other audience in mind. A lexicographer, when he wants to write a dictionary, the first question that comes to mind is that who the audience are. And uh, so by in this sense, we don't have actually any uh, English Persian learners dictionary as far well, uh, as far as I know. Now against this background over the state of arts for uh, in, Persian dictionaries, learners' dictionaries. Uh, I'm uh, introducing uh, this um, online Persian picture dictionary. It is a multimedia environment in which the Persian words are matched with the objects and activities illustrated in team-based images. And the words are accompanied by audio files. So the main question, the main problem that this dictionary is going to solve is actually giving easy access for pronunciation. And then images are supposed to reflect everyday life in Iran today. So now I'm stop sharing my presentation and I'm going to show the dictionary itself. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it is available on persianpicturedictionary.com. And uh, so um, the uh, categories that we have are people, activities, spaces, class, uh, and ceremonies in Iran. And then, for example, if I go to a kitchen, so you see a picture and a graphic design of a and kitchen, uh, which uh, our graphic designer tried to look like as much as possible to a Persian uh, or a Persian kitchen, and with all all the items. So, uh, and if you click on each one of them, you have the name of the word in, written in the Persian script, and you have the audio file that you can play. Oh, so let's move. This one. Oh, then if you click on this, you have freezer or any of them. Chahu Satsle Zobale. If you click on something that you have already clicked, it only shows that it is on the list, and then you can listen oh, to the uh, pronunciation again. So that is for kitchen, for example, for daily route for activities. If you go to daily routine, uh, you have you click here, and this gives infinitives after uh, activities or. Subhane khordan. 
and the times are going to give uh, the uh, audience some clue as what the events are or at what time of the uh, day they happen. For classroom, for example, again, you have all the objects listed and then you can play. Case computer. Danish Amuz. And also there, there, is a, there is a category for ceremonies in Iran. Uh, so we have a limited content at this phase of the project for ceremonies in Iran. I only uh, have uh, five subcategories. For example, if you go to Persian New Year, uh, you might know that for Persian New Year, we set a table with seven things that uh, start with S with uh, some other items. So you have a picture of them here, and then you can click on each one of them. You have the word. Sip. Uh, in the Persian script and also pronounced for, uh, by a native speaker. Tunge Mahi. So, uh, yes. Uh, oh, I wanted to also show about, I uh, explain a little bit about um, the team. So, Yes, yeah, so uh, as I said, the project was funded by a Circle Faculty Research Fellow grant in 2020. The team included uh, myself, a software developer, a graphic designer, and two students, two native speakers of Persian who were responsible for data collection and data entry. Uh, it was additional support was given by the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, and also we had a traditional art researcher and tutor as the uh, 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 advisor for the project. Uh, yes, so that is for uh, the dictionary. And now as some uh, reflections and some uh, thoughts after doing the project. Uh, yes. So uh, features of the online version of the dictionary, uh, it provides accessible pronunciation pronounced by native speakers. It is independent of the source language of the learner, because as you see, there was no English involved. It is just the picture, the Persian word, and the pronunciation. So people, learners of Persian from all over the world, no matter if the source language is English or not, can use this, and this uh, platform. The content can be expanded to include other categories and subcategories like health, clothing, food, etc. And the infra infrastructure that we uh, prepared for this um, dictionary can be used to develop other picture dictionaries for other languages. So uh, I know Turkish uses the Latin um, uh, script, so the uh, in Turkish instructors might not have the same problems that we as Persian and Arabic. Uh, language instructors have, but at least for Arabic, that the pronunciation is again another big thing for students. This infrastructure can be used to develop uh, Arabic, uh, online Arabic uh, picture dictionary or, or uh, any other language. Uh, so, some reflections for the next steps of the project. Uh, so, at this phase, we use graphic designs, and uh, I am happy with the uh, uh, quality of the uh, graphic designs that we uh, ended up for this project. But for later steps of the project, I thought maybe we should use start to using photos as well. So for example, if I want to uh, uh, show a, a street in Tehran or in Iran with all the details, it might uh, make more sense to use a photo instead of a graphic design of a street. But then it has its own um, challenges and questions. So first of all, we need a, a, a professional a photographer to take a specially for to take photos specially for this project. Because for example, if you look up a, a street in Tehran uh, on Google uh, images, uh, putting apart all the questions of copyrights, if you want to use that in your project, putting it apart, uh, first of all, you are not able to find a good photo because you need a photo which has all the details and it is very difficult to find a photo that has all the details in one place. And then uh, it, uh, another uh, challenge for this, uh, for the uh, continuation of this project is that, what about more abstract words? So for more advanced learners, we have lots of abstract words. Uh, I 
uh, just randomly uh, put some of them in this slide, for example, تأثیر گذاشتن to influence or جذابیت, attraction, تورم, inflation, or احساساتی, emotional. It's difficult or almost diff uh, impossible to use them to show them through images, but still it's something that our, our uh, intermediate or advanced learners need and they still uh, don't know how to pronounce these words or they have problems pronouncing these words and also uh, see them in uh, good illustrative examples. So what can be done is that we can add a word list to this dictionary uh, apart from uh, pictures, now we can have a word list with pronunciation plus one to uh, illustrative examples for the more abstract words so that we have both uh, more ordinary words that are related to everyday life uh, throughout through pictures. And then we have uh, we can have some more abstract words uh, with pronunciation and examples for more advanced uh, learners. So, uh, so that's it. I'm uh, looking forward to hearing your thoughts and your, uh, as I said, it's something that uh, started last May and it will uh, end this May, but uh, it is the first phase and I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts and your feedback to improve the project. Thank you. <laughs>